Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams. Coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour, the Canadian woman sitting in a Mexico jail for two years now. Thousands of immigrants testing positive for HIV being allowed into our country. And more parents turning to the courts when their kids flunk out in school. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. Talk about a continued travesty of justice. The Canadian woman in Mexico locked up for two years now awaiting trial. Should Canada get tough with Mexico? And thousands of immigrants testing positive for HIV are being allowed entry into our country. And more parents turning to the court when their kids flunk out in school. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is a lawyer and leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. And Dr. Tom Williamson is a retired physician. And as always, on our Viewpoints days, you, the viewer, are our third guest. Feel free to call in at any time with your comments on any of the subject matters that we're discussing today. The first one, you've probably heard about it again and again. It's been very high profile in the news media. It's about the lady in Mexico the Canadian that's stuck in a Mexico jail now. There you see John Iveson of the National Post. No justice for Brenda Martin in Mexico. You must admit, this is a sad, sad story. This lady, and I'm going to start off by saying she's been on suicide watch. It's not the same to be stuck in a Mexico jail as it is to be in a Canadian jail. That's the first thing we have to say. But the woman was arrested on for money laundering and being involved in some scam um, from her former boss. A lot of unusual facts involving the woman's history with this boss. Apparently she lost her job first, then lo and behold, she was investing in his company and of course subsequently arrested by the cops with unsavory dealings. But the bottom line is here, she's stuck in this prison. This situation here has become quite political because an article came out in, today's, in yesterday's paper saying MP chose party over Mexican prison visit. We're talking about the Conservative MP Helena Juarez here, just Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. She was in Mexico, never paid the woman a visit, so it has reached the political levels. And let's face it, there are those calling for government action that perhaps we need to get tough on Mexico. She's one of our nationals, she's sitting in there for a jail, devastated, distraught, and from the point of view of what should be done about this woman? Do you think it's time that Canada get involved politically? I'm going to start with you, Paul. Well, you know, it's interesting. There may be, a, there may be some uh, wisdom in not making too much of a public splash about dealings uh, over this issue in Mexico. The government mm. might be being very prudent. For example, if uh, the minister were there to go there and, you know, raise her fist and say, you better, you'd better, and, mm. or this is corrupt, or this is uh, not just, um, that might put the government of Mexico on the spot to yes. the point where they then have to keep her in to make a point. So it may very well be that this is actually a wise move not to do, do things uh, too loudly, too publicly. Um, there's very little a government can or even should do with respect to goings on in another country. Uh, for example, I mean, we, the purpose of government is to protect freedom on this turf, on this stretch that we call Canada. Uh, we have no authority anywhere else in the world, our government mm -hmm. doesn't, uh, to bring guns, to bring... So there's very little that a government can do. It's uh, in some ways uh, all the more passionately argued because of the fact that the lady is uh, apparently on a suicide watch. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to you know, look at this thing with a level head. The government does have limits in terms of what it can do. And yes. a soft diplomacy might be all it really can do. And I don't think we should hold the government uh, to blame for doing... Uh, just that, which apparently is what they're involved in, because, I mean, there are limits. We have to respect other jurisdictions. Hmm. Okay. Dr. Williamson, what's your view on this? Well, I think there are two things that we need to get clear before we get into the specific case. Mm -hmm. First of all, is the newspaper reporting accurate about her? Do we know all the facts? And I'm dubious mm. about that. I, I agree. I have heard mm. it said that she was in... Uh, this is just gossip, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm heard it said that she's in Mexico illegally. That does make a difference if it were true. I don't know whether it's true. The second thing, and it's an even bigger issue, 
is the acceptance of foreign laws for Canadians overseas. Should we be accepting yes. that mm -hmm. or not? In the old days, with powerful countries in Europe and so on, in the days of the British Royal Navy, for example, you didn't arrest a British national in a foreign country who would have a warship on your doorstep next week. <laughs> and uh, I admit that this is the old uh, battleship diplomacy and out of date, but it does make you think. And if we are going to simply straightforwardly accept that this poor lady, for example, as a good example of it, went to Mexico, she's been arrested for some reason or other, we, do we accept that arrest as just law? Well, our idea of justice, our idea of human rights, as the article says, is not the same as the Mexicans. And mm -hmm. having some contact with Mexico and other Latin American states, I can assure you, I wouldn't want to be in a Latin jail for a few days, let alone two years. The standards mm -hmm. and the attitudes are totally well, different. One of, our, one of the complaints she has here is that she wasn't given an interpreter. She wasn't even given an English-speaking lawyer. Yeah. She was basically spoken to in Spanish, given some document to, to um, in that country to, to sign, yeah. which is puzzling to me because she went ahead and signed it anyway. Mm -hmm. And apparently, according to this article, it was a, a confession of guilt. Mm -hmm. So obviously that bears some implication. But the bottom line is, as you put it, their laws and how they deal with the system is entirely different than the way we do things here. Which brings me to that. the next notion, and you're saying we have to accept that because... If, if we yes. accept this principle that a Canadian in a foreign country is subject to foreign laws, we have to accept that. We don't have a leg to stand on. Do you on. think there are ever any cases, though, where we should not accept that? For instance, we saw a case not long ago where somebody was in a jail in Saudi Arabia. We even saw before that where somebody was executed in the States and the Canadian government was lamb just lambasted by the, the Canadian society because we didn't get involved and we didn't ask for this man's um, release. Do yeah. you really think that Canada should be involved in that, in that capacity, because there has been a call for it. Yeah, I think there's a difference also between, you know, the situation where a person voluntarily enters another jurisdiction fully knowing that they're leaving behind the safety of the Canadian judicial system and chooses, you know, a person who chooses to go to Mexico knowing what happened to the INROs and et cetera. Um, and, and as distinguished from those cases where a Canadian uh, who has a right of entry back into Canada is, you know, jettisoned off to some third world nation, hung upside down and tortured. Mm -hmm. I think there, uh, especially if the regime is completely uh, not respectful of, of individual liberty and freedom, there you might even have a situation where you might have to uh, send in you know, mm -hmm. your, your tax squad or whatever. But um, uh, you know, Mexico, we, are having, we have a NAFTA agreement in place. Uh, if they're good enough to uh, contract with, and I'm not saying they are, but that's the fact, we've decided to to effectively contract them through this treaty, mm -hmm. uh, then we have to remember that there are consequences of any kind of stronger action than diplomatic. Yeah. Well, it's worthwhile to note also, because the article points out, too, that our Foreign Affairs Minister, Mr. Bernier, also sent a letter to the Mexican government, and he's w awaiting a response. And he's also, okay, now, we're looking at also the guy who wrote this article, John Iveson, because he's actually suggesting that if we don't get a response, that perhaps it's time for Canada to maybe issue some kind of a statement telling Canadians not to go over there for holiday. I mean, this is not a hard um, a boycott um, being implemented here, but it's basically what you would call a call to a boycott, to boycott that country. Yeah, you know, the, and I think if you look at uh, the government's websites, they are already warning you that, you know, when you go to Mexico in particular... You're in Mexico. You're going to be, you know, under a, a regime where there have been some uh, off-color dealings and, and you may be finding yourself in the midst of them. So, um, you know, sort of traveler beware. You know, there are good reasons yes, why countries... Yes, traveler beware. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are good reasons why things are cheap in other countries. Uh, they're cheap because they don't have the kind of society we have here in Canada. It's expensive to buy a Coca-Cola in Canada because we have a great country. Yes. And it's cheap in some third world nations to buy jewelry and clothes and et cetera and to lie on the beach <laughs> precisely because you don't have that quality of life. You don't have the civility that we yes. have in North America. Well, Comes at a high I price. May, may I object a little bit to that? I think you're looking at it, I don't blame you, but you are looking at it through Western eyes. Sure. They don't look that way. To them, 
your attitude and my attitude might be equally offensive, you know. Let's, let's say, let's understand if we accept this principle mm -hmm. that a Canadian abroad is subject to those laws, then they should be well aware of it, the Canadians mm -hmm. should. Sure. And mm -hmm. I don't think putting something on the internet and posting it on electronic media is enough. I think mm -hmm. we need to say it loud and clear. Mm -hmm. And I also feel, I don't think the government's responsible for what happens to this woman, so you don't believe as the article mm -hmm. suggests. I yes. think that's very wrong. I agree. If anything happens to this woman, it's the Mexican government that's responsible, not the Canadian. Let's put responsibility where it is. Mm -hmm. and okay, a question I'm going to ask you when we come back, though, because we must go for a break now. To what degree is a country, like Canada, of course, this is what we're talking about today, responsible for its citizens? We're going to go for a break now. Remember to call in at any time with your comments. We'll get to you after the break. Stay tuned. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're continuing to talk about, well, you have to say it's a sad case of that woman in Mexico stuck there in a Mexican jail for two years. Well, there's been a cry and you may ask yourself, well, who is that cry coming from? Is it you, the members of the public? Is it the media that's overplaying this? Is it the, um, well, I can't even say it's the opposition because according to Iveson in this article, he's saying shame on the liberals as well as the conservatives because during question period, there wasn't even an issue made of it. It was still stuck on the Cadman affair. Right. So right. nobody apparently at the top levels of government have been making a big deal. However, it's fair to say that our foreign affairs minister has written a letter to the Mexican government. But the question we're asking you, do you think that our government should be more involved in this case with this woman who has been on suicide watch? Let's go now to Andy on line four. Hi, Andy. You're on the line. Yeah, hi, Christine. You saw, uh, you stole a lot of my thunder there when it's I was okay. talking to Jeff there. Okay, about the you know the about the Saudi Arabian thing and all yep. this that and the other. Anyways, uh, my point is okay. Like uh, as Canadians, we are a bunch of wimps. Okay, when it comes to defending our own people from overseas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like we just wimp out. You know, just like uh, it's just totally astonishing. Okay, because our our country is a country of warriors. But however, 
you know, like when it comes to police malfeasance and police uh, corruption, I mean, the Mexicans, you know, are past masters, okay? I mean, I live, even lived in California for two years, and uh, we did not dare step a foot, you know, into Mexico. And I mean, you know, and I even warned all four of my adult daughters, okay? Okay, Andy, I'm going to ask you on that note. You said you didn't step foot in Mexico. As an individual, knowing how the Mexican government works, knowing how the police work, you made that decision not to go there. For a person who makes that decision to go there, and although we don't know all the facts surrounding this case, there are some shady facts involved that we do have to question because we don't know the woman's guilt or innocence. No. In our system, innocent until proven guilty, unfortunately in the Mexican system it would seem like guilty until proven innocent. But you made that choice not to go there for that reason. Do you think the onus should be on the citizens who choose to go there, Andy? Well, my point is, as I said, you know, like I have four adult daughters, and I refused uh, many times, you know, uh, that they go there. Okay, they want to go to Puerto Vallarta, uh, Cancun, and I said, no, go to Jamaica, go to uh, uh, Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico, go to Haiti, okay, and that's where they all went. I mean, you know, like boycott Mexico. Boycott Mexico. Andy, thanks for your call. Now... Andy thinks that, well, he's saying that the government, we're a bunch of wimps when it comes to looking after our nationals. It's not a clear-cut situation. I, I believe there's a time and a place to look after nationals, but is this case it? That's a good, very good point. I think every case would, you know, we'd like every case to it's be different. it. It's different. But, you know, you're only going to get so many favors at the diplomatic level. Uh -huh. And, okay, yes, this lady is uh, unfortunately uh, a reportedly suicidal and that mm -hmm. would seem to bring her up in importance a few levels but yes. but she's not being tortured from what I understand mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't scurried off to Mexico uh, in the cover of night she chose to be there she's been living there apparently for years and yes, now she's yes. calling upon her, her government that she I know she has a citizenship of Canada but I don't know that she's necessarily been paying taxes here or living here or anything mm -hmm. else I, I don't know the details on that and uh, we're getting worked up because she happens to be you know hold a Canadian citizenship but you know, I'm much more concerned with the person who is scurried off under cover of night. I'm concerned more about things like extraditing people when we don't agree with the laws in the place to hmm. which we're extraditing them. So, you know, um, yes. I think you have to pick your battles. And yes, I'm not sure that this is necessarily the one sure the government should. The one. No. And that's a question we're actually asking you in a sense. Is this a battle for you that perhaps we should be getting involved in? Let's go now to you, Gary, on line three. Hi, Gary. You're on the line. Yeah, hello. Yes, go uh, ahead. I'd actually like to make about three comments. Um, you know, this, this fellow that just phoned and told us that we're wimpy Canadians. What about the American uh, murderers that are in Canadian jails? And they demand for them to come back. And, and we don't send them back. It's too bad the U.S. doesn't send a regiment up here and a couple of warplanes and, and pick them up uh, with that attitude. This woman wasn't on holidays. Mm -hmm. She wasn't on vacation. You know, that's a good point you make. And, and I'm going to take you up on that afterward, but you got another point to make, Gary? Go ahead with it. Yeah, that woman wasn't on, I don't know what gives her, like, precedence or whatever, but she, she wasn't on vacation. She was down there on her own free will, scamming people, apparently. And thing, there's people in, in India and Pakistan and people that are dying, they're being killed because they're Christians. And we import those people into this country. Why don't we look after them? the ones that are dying. You know? mm -hmm. Gary, thanks for that call. I, I, I'd like to hear what you think about Gary's point, but before you, you give a feedback here, Gary said something very important. The woman was not on holiday, which brings us back to, we've had other cases in the past where people who did go on holiday there um, got into trouble. Right. And the same question was raised, should Canada get involved? And I, I can't think of a better reason. If somebody's vacationing in a country and they're not being properly protected, perhaps you need to issue a warning to the Canadian public saying, go at your own risk. Yeah. Any, any feedback to what Gary is saying here? Well, I, I've been to Mexico several times and, and I've seen the way some people behave. Mm -hmm. If you walk around at 1.30 in the morning in any major city flashing a roll of $50 bills, you you're asking for you it. expect to be hit on the head. On the other hand, if you behave in a normal, what I call a normal manner, I've never had any problems in Mexico or other Latin American countries. However, mm -hmm. setting that to the side for the moment, I do think it will be a good thing if the Canadian diplomatic representatives in general got a little tougher with the governments that they are 
liaising with in whatever country they might be. I think to establish a tough-minded policy would be a good thing. Uh, now, in this article, I mean, this to me is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. It says, Prime Minister Harper would be perfect or will be perfectly justified if he examines a range of retaliatory options such as issuing a travel advisory. Yes. Do you think the Mexican government's going to worry about that? They mm -hmm. won't like it, mm -hmm. but they're certainly not going to lose any sleep. It's not quite retaliatory. It. No. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I think, the, I mean, there were, there were mistakes here, obviously. This woman should never have been sedated by injection before a point. No, and that's another before point. any committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and she should have had a Spanish translator. Those are two obvious things. And a new point has cropped up in today's news. I don't even know now. I'm pouncing it on you whether you've seen it. But yeah, have, this boss, yeah. you've seen it. This former boss that she worked for and that she got implicated in this whole mess with is now saying that the Mexican government is keeping her prisoner because they want half a million dollars that he promised them when he was released. Yeah. And if they pay that, then she'll get released. Did you buy this? Oh, I... I Do you believe that? I don't believe anything I don't have evidence of, but I... Well, of course not. You're a lawyer. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would certainly not write it off as impossible. Mm -hmm. No way. I, I, you know, I assume that there are... You know, look at Canada, look at the United States, look at Britain, and then look at the rest of the world. Perhaps there are, you know, Germany, etc. But most of the world is not like the country we're used to living in. True. We are becoming aware okay. of these countries because yes. of because television cameras now are going to them and showing people Precisely. living, and mm -hmm. they look the same on TV. They've got cities and cars, and maybe the cars aren't as nice. We figure they're a bit poorer, but you know, poverty has a root in something that's much deeper, and it's a f yes. philosophical uh, thing. It's you know, the Canadian and American and British way of life mm -hmm. is founded on a ph philosophical basis, a belief about the meaning of life, about the nature of reality, about the role of things like religion mm -hmm. and clubs and collectives and et cetera, and the separation of those things from the proper governance of the state, the belief that government has a limited role, not an unlimited role. And so, you know, um, I think we're just starting to wake up, perhaps, to the, to the fact, and hopefully we'll understand the fact There's that... articles like this yeah, that we need, to the surface. That's right. It, it, we need to remember that we are very lucky to be living in a philosophically superior... That's I look true. through Western eyes, I say I look through, you know, unblemished eyes, yes. and, I, and, and I say... In some cases, <laughs> rose lenses. <laughs> Well, no, I, that's, the, that's the beauty. I, I think I, in, Nor in North America, Westerners, you know, people who advocate the Western way of life, have, have managed like no one else on earth to yes. pull those rose yes. lenses off. And, uh, and that's hopefully what the TV will function to do in those other countries as well. Right, hopefully. We're going to go for a break now. We'll be back to you on the phone lines after this. Stay tuned.
Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're continuing to talk about that woman stranded in a Mexico jail for two years, still awaiting trial. Let's go now to you, Maria, on line four. Hi, Maria. You're on the line. Hi there. How are you? Fine, thanks. Good. Actually, believe it or not, I just came off uh, uh, the airplane from California yesterday <laughs> and we were talking about going to Mexico. So mm -hmm. I definitely just put the TV on and thought, I definitely want to make a comment. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, I need... I think we need to educate ourselves before we travel anywhere. I mean, how many people go up north and just say, oh, let's just take a drive up north and see what's going on. We have to plan where we're going, particularly if we're going to Mexico. Mm -hmm. When I was there, I couldn't believe the stories I heard um, about people that are American citizens going over to Mexico and they can't even get back in um, because the Mexican people want, they, they want money, yes. so they you know, you have to bribe them. It, it's terrible. They're very rough. In many cases, they have their open guns, and they're not afraid to use them. Um, they seem to have their own little world over there, and I was totally scared to death, you know, even thinking that I'm, I'm going to go over there for the day. Maria, you bring up an excellent point. Now, on the note of what Maria is saying, I'm not sure I buy that a half a million dollars is the reason why they're keeping her there. However, I do buy the argument that if you were to bribe these people half a million dollars and say, well, will you let her go for half a million? I have the feeling they will. <laughs> Uh, to say that's the reason they're holding her is a different story than saying if I were to bribe these people, would they let her go? Because they probably will. I, I strongly encourage anyone who wants to use their own money to t test that theory to do <laughs> they so. They can go ahead and do but so. But I don't want the government of Canada to be spending my money on it. Uh, but I like what Maria said, though, yeah, that people yeah. need to do their research, even down to the simple things if you're going to be a tourist. Because you go to certain countries, you're even out after dark. I'm talking maybe 8.30 in the night. You can get yourself killed if you go in certain areas. So it's better to know where you're going and know have knowledge, because you may be surprised. In, that includes the United States, where it's dangerous to go to certain areas. You need to talk to people who've lived there or been there a lot. Well, just last week, Find out fact, about it. I'm, I'm going to say what you said there even in the States. E even last week, I, I, and this is not the only time I've heard it, that there are certain places in Detroit, you don't stop for a red light in the night. You go right through, because if you don't, you're going to be held up and shot at that point. Yeah. And this is something that's foreign to a lot of us over here. We yes. can't imagine a place like that, but if yeah. you go somewhere, you need to be knowledgeable. Yeah. Let's go now to Al on line three. Hi, Al, you're on the line. Hello, um, I've been listening to some of your people talking, and mm -hmm. I lived in Mexico for five years, worked mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and I never had a problem, never. Kept your nose clean. <clears throat> Hello? You kept your nose clean? Oh yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, you know, there's, uh, I lived in Guadalajara, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just outside Guadalajara, there's a place called Lake Chapala, and there's a lot of Canadians living there, and they never have a problem. But on a serious note, would you say, Al, that when you went there, you, um, you were aware of your surroundings, you knew what the culture was, you knew what was acceptable there, what wasn't? Sure, you've got to think like a Mexican, yeah. not like a Canadian or a Yank. Yeah, good advice, Al. Thanks for calling in. We're going to move on now to our second subject matter with, with um, viewpoints on the line. And once again, I'm going to say that if you want to call and talk about the first topic, anyone that we're discussing today, you're welcome to do so. Now, the second one is immigrants with HIV allowed into Canada. That was, of course, revealed, as you can see there, by the sun. Did this surprise you that thousands of immigrants are being allowed in? I mean, we're not talking here about refugees because in, in many cases with refugees, and I'd like to say most cases, it's a desperate situation at hand and we take them in as, um, well, compassion. We're a country of compassion. We're known by this. But immigrants being tested, coming into our country, HIV positive, thousands of them. And not only that, but... I had this article saved that we discussed, um, well, back in February, actually. It was just lying around, and I happened to, um, to get wind of it today. It's, it's, it's a bit in bad shape, but I'm going to hold it up for you anyway, okay? Here it is. I'm going to hold it up for you anyway. It says, defenseless against a world of TB. Toronto, with its growing immigration population, will likely see an increase of deadly, contagious tuberculosis. A lot of these trains of tuberculosis as well are there. They're antibiotic resistant strains, very resistant. And 
basically to accept people into the country knowing that they have these diseases? I'm going to leave it open to the two of you. Hear what you think about it. Dr. Williamson, what do you think? Well, I think this is a very difficult issue. It's a, not so much a medical one as a philosoph one of philosophy. I don't believe that you should keep somebody out of a country just because they have a particular microbe. Now, that might not be a particularly common Canadian feeling. I understand the f attitude towards many diseases, and there's a huge difference, if I might say it, from the public health aspect between tuberculosis and being HIV positive. Tuberculosis yes, a is a huge, real huge problem right around the world, and mm -hmm. there's no question about it. The more immigration you have, the more likely you are to import, even if you have tested a case that's been missed and misdiagnosed and so on. Nothing is 100% in medicine. Mm -hmm. Med a medical result or diagnosis is an opinion. But if a person shows up positive, should we take them things. in? I, I don't think you should have an automatic ban, but I believe, for example, yes. some countries do, like Australia. Mm -hmm. I understand Australia would be rejecting anybody who tested positive. Personally, I don't believe that microbes follow the law. Mm -hmm. I don't think they can read government advisories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Lorraine Lavallee, who is the spokesman for um, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, I, I just found it was kind of strange what she said here that they're not considered, okay, fine, they're not considered a public health risk, that people have discussed this widely with HIV, that's one story, but when she says nor an excessive burden on the medical system, we already have excessive burdens on the medical system as is. Our population is getting older, and from the point of view of allowing, and we're talking, let's say, in a year here, if we keep on doing this, letting in HIV positive people, what is that going to translate to into our already strained medical system? I have concerns about this. I, yes. Well, you know, that's, that's exactly the point I took out of this whole story. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, HIV, I would put in the same category as, you know, breast cancer or a bad heart, uh, unless the, it's, it's only, it's only, uh, you know, imprudent conduct that can pass the infection on. It's not like the airborne disease of TB. So um, I would agree with uh, Dr. Williamson in that regard. But, you know, I would much rather have people coming into the country who have cancer or a bad heart or HIV. Because you still can't get. Well, well yes. I'd rather have them come in yes. and be in favor of, you know, non-tax funded private health care than have a bunch of healthy people come in and say, I want to take everybody's money and make them pay for my health care. Mm -hmm. To my mind, the philosophical issue, the mm -hmm. political issue is more important than the fact that someone has bad health. The real issue here is we've created a system mm -hmm. that's inherently, it's almost built to implode. And we're trying I, to use I agree, that. I agree. And we're, and we're trying to use that as an excuse to be racist or to be fear-mongering about various diseases, to be anti-immigration. And you often see the anti-immigration crowd, the anti, um, uh, you know, the people who, who who relate all HIV to homosexuality, et cetera. They'll use the healthcare system strain argument mm -hmm. over and over and over again. To my mind, that proves only one thing: that the healthcare system shouldn't be tax-funded, and that anybody coming into this country. Uh, is free to buy the health care insurance that suits them. Whether they're healthy or ill is irrelevant unless what they're bringing in is something that's airborne or easily passed, like the TB, for example, in which case I think the state has a proper role, or the government has a proper role in preventing them from entering. But that's mm -hmm. just a health yes. crisis situation. That's not a question of philosophy. Um, philosophically, I think the bigger danger is bringing communists into the country rather than bringing <laughs> capitalists in. <laughs> And we want to hear what your response is to what we're discussing today. We're going to go for a break. We'll get back to you straight after this. Stay tuned.
Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Let's go straight to you now to Lorna on line three. Hello, Lorna, you're on the line. I just want to make a comment about this so-called TB square that the scare the media seems to be so careful to put in the headlines. I think it's absolutely exaggerated and distorted. I happen to be someone of the thousands and thousands of people who've had TB. Fifty years ago in Ontario, there were 2,500 TB beds here in our own province. And when they keep saying these people have a drug-resistant strain of TB, if that was true, they'd all be dying. So I think a lot of it is vastly distorted. I know about 25 years ago when I went to Australia and I put down that I'd had this, my goodness gracious, the doctor at the other end of the line sounded as if I was going to contaminate the whole whole, um, continent. And I think a lot of these doctors have absolutely no experience in TB. All they do is read about in a book and get very dramatic about it. And I think the media, once again, they don't know either. And I just think it it gives a lot of these people a terrible disservice Mm -hmm. to talk this way because they really don't know what they're talking about. Lorna, thanks for calling in with that comment. Now, Dr. Williamson, do you have any feedback whatsoever? I, I mean, we know the media, okay? There are times where the media is just sometimes and there are other times where it's strictly media hype what do you think it is well i i think bad news sells no, newspapers oh, of course. yeah that, that's, that's a, a given. big thing that's a given. and i'm 99 percent in, in, in a f- agreement and favor of this lady who called i couldn't agree more but uh, it's a big big issue there's huge differences even just out of interest between britain and North America in the way we handle tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. In Britain, we believe that everybody should be converted in their skin test to positive because by doing that, we've given them some resistance. Here, if you suggest that, they do backward somersaults and get all allergic Mm -hmm. and come out in skin rashes and get terrible. You know, that's a psychological comment, not a real thing. (laughs) They, They get so upset. So there's huge differences of attitude from different parts of the world. But we still need to be careful. This. Oh, we need mm-hmm. to be careful, no question about it. Uh, and I think it's a m- much bigger issue, public health-wise, than HIV-positive people, even if they do go on to have AIDS. It's a much bigger issue, tuberculosis. Well, it is a serious issue, and... and I know that people tend to panic sometimes, but how would most of us feel if we found out, for example, that in our child's school, there's a kid sitting in that class with active tuberculosis? How would you feel about it? Right, worried. It, exactly. Let's go now to Patrick on line four. Hi, Patrick. You're on the line. Hi. Uh, yes, my comment is um, based on the topic um, previous to this one, mm-hmm. that the woman in Mexico, uh, when, when um, one of us, uh, somebody from, um, actually when somebody from Mexico or, or an overseas country comes in to Canada or the U.S., we expect them to speak English. We expect them to understand English. Um, for her to sign the papers basically admitting her guilt um, she should have known what she was signing. She should have had an understanding of the language uh, in the country that she's in before she signs any kind of, you know, important legal papers or any kind of documents like that. You know, Patrick, you got a good point. A- any feedback there? Well, you, you know, want to go on here? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I look at uh, pe- things that people are, are signing or asked to sign or that ha- they have signed almost every day in my legal practice. And uh, these are English documents, you yes. know, and literate people. Uh, reading English documents and many people I'll never even see in my office because they just signed, they felt pressured, they didn't quite know what was going on and they didn't want to spend the 200 bucks to come see me. Yes. (laughs) So, you know, uh, it's it's unfortunate because the the amount of loss that is suffered by people who just don't uh, come and get the proper legal advice at those key points. You never, ever sign a legal document without first reviewing it with a lawyer. It's it's insanity, you know, it's, it's but it happens folly. commonly. It's absolute, it's absolute folly to do so, but I, somebody brought it to my attention, and, okay, you feel sorry for the woman. You, you, you should have some kind of a compassion on this one. We're, we're discussing here the justice of it all, but from a point of view of compassion, I, I feel sorry for the woman. But one thing that was brought to my attention in interviews that were seen with Brenda Martin, she's... She's very, very, very emotional. And if you look at this scenario here, you take a highly emotional person, stuff them in a Mexican jail, yell in their faces perhaps, that could have been what's happening, with um, some intimidating people with a different language. The woman probably thought, well, what's going to come next, a a bullet if I don't sign this document? So we really don't know what the scenario was here. But we know the woman has been in in turmoil under suicide watch. And I feel bad for the woman. You might be 
perfectly stable before you went into that. But you, jail, you may not but be I'm, after, after. I'm sure school. you'd be very <laughs> emotional you after a week after or two. That. I agree. We're going to go for a break now. We'll be back to you after this. Stay tuned. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're continuing to talk about, in fact, both our cases here that we've addressed so far. We're still hearing from you on the phone lines with the Mexican lady stuck in a Mexican jail for the past two years. I mean, we're also discussing the case about immigration. How do you feel about HIV positive immigrants being allowed into the country? Let's go now to you, Pima, on line five. Hi, Pima, you're on the line. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my uh, comment is regarding the uh, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. It's just a media scare. I myself have worked uh, back home in tuberculosis control project for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then I worked, I worked in laboratory. I've been seeing the patient like uh, becoming from positive to negative in two months. Mm -hmm. And when I came here, I myself got checked up because I, I too I had the tuberculosis uh, 10 years before when I came back to, when I came to Canada. And they took me for two years of violence, mm -hmm. even though I was negative in the beginning. And even the doctors who worked over there, they had very little knowledge about tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. You know, I, this, that's the second caller that said that, about the doctors having limited knowledge about the tuberculosis, the media hype. How do, did the two of you have a feedback on that? I mean, doctors in our country, let's face it, and that was one thing that did come out in this huge center page article that I have here, that the doctors in our country don't have a lot of experience with it, but it goes back to that whole notion that the rules, the laws, the, the health concerns we have in our country is not the same as in other countries. But I, I must say that there is a point at which there is a media hype, but at the same time, we don't want to be like some of these other countries either, which is why we tend to be very suspicious and careful about 
these things. Sure. And I think it's for all of our protection, including the immigrants that come here with a clean bill of health. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, and, and just because it's uh, misunderstood doesn't mean that it isn't dangerous, you know. Yes, and, and I'm yes. not saying, and I think Dr. Williamson is much better authority than I would ever yes. be on this. And you and, commented on this before. Yeah, yes. but, you know, so it, it is possible to overstate the risk. But it's also possible to understate it. And I think, you know, put in the balance against things like AIDS or cancer mm -hmm. or heart, uh, I think it's probably the bigger, the bigger concern. But it would do doctors well to be more um, knowledgeable about this because it seems well, to be cropping up more and more. Yes, but I mean, you can say there's a many things. Malaria is a disease in which Canadian oh, doctors crucial. don't know very much about. And maybe dysentery is another one. The tropical diseases which are now being imported back because of rapid air travel and more in immigration. So, you know, there's no ending to this, sure. And the, the doctor in the Middle East who's an expert on, on, on malaria, for example, probably doesn't know much about heart disease compared to the Canadian. Yes. So nothing is perfect. I, I, I couldn't, That's a good point. I couldn't judge whether the balance is right or not. That's a good point. Now we're going to go back to you on the phone lines because I'm anxious to go on to our last topic because it's going to be about parents more and more starting to take teachers to court over their children failing in school. Eager to get to that one, but let's go quickly now to you, Betty, on line four. Hi, Betty, you're on the line. Hi, I was calling about the lady from Trenton. Mm -hmm. Now, the gentleman said she needed an interpreter, and she had been there six or seven years before jail. Yeah. Did she not learn something of the language? <laughs> That's she a very good point, Betty. <laughs> she worked in a catering business. Yes. She had worked for this ex-boss, supposedly, for 10 months, at minimum wage of 8.15 or something an hour. Now, I got this off of W-5. He gave her $26,000, two years severance pay. She supposedly took that and put it into a catering business. Um, he got rid of her because his mother didn't like her, said she, what, drank too much and swore too much or something. And if you go into, uh, which month is it, January's Reader's Digest, people from Toronto are selling their homes to buy homes in Mexico and retire. I wouldn't do it because I'm not a traveler. <laughs> Betty, you bring up some excellent points. Thanks for calling in. Let's go now to Marsha on line three. Hi, Marsha. You're on the line. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to say a quick thing about Brenda Martin. Uh, I had a friend that went to Mexico with uh, the, the elite of Canada. They jetted down. A couple of uh, jets went down. And also in the States, there was a party going on down there, and, and they were invited for the weekend. And there was also a young British couple that were just on vacation walking by that house. And the police came out and, and uh, wanted to see their passports. They opened their passports up, and they checked them, and they told them to go into the house. There was a great party going on. And as soon as they got in there, they went in there very long, and uh, the police came in and arrested every one of them. They took the Americans and separated them. They were very, very jeweled, well jeweled, and the Canadians, and she spent... Uh, I think it was about 24 hours in jail overnight with all the yes, Marcia, and your major point. Thanks for calling in. Now, we're going to go for a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about a growing trend, according to an article I have here, parents taking teachers to court because their kids are flunking out in school. We'll be back to talk about it after this. Stay tuned.
Hello again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Well, take a look at the third story we're talking about. I wish we had a longer time to discuss it, but here it is now. The new golden rule, well, here you have it, a kid writing on the board, but more parents turn into the courts when their children fail in school. Now, this article highlights different cases, and I, I'm going to put it to our panel, of course, to find out is there a reason that these parents have that is justified in taking a teacher to court? For example, the way the article starts out, I didn't find it very encouraging. It talks about a, a British Columbia father suing his grade two um, son's teacher, a Montessori teacher, because he claims that she purposely and maliciously worked to damage his self-esteem over such thing as, and here, here it is here, failing to encourage the child's spelling not sending home a daily homework list, and in one case, displaying an unfinished poem in the school hallway. Now, I think that's utter nonsense, because for, for, for a teacher to display an unfinished poem, I, I agree, that is humiliation. But to take a teacher to court, my rebuttal will be, well, as a parent, if you're that upset to go to court, why aren't you checking your kid's homework? That is a whole lot easier than taking a teacher to court. It's less time consuming to check your kid's homework. But there are other um, cases in this, in this particular article that talks about some cases where a kid was bitten by another student and, and found, quote, naked in a washroom with another student. Come on. I mean, some cases are, could be life-changing for a student. And if the appropriate measures are not taken by that school or that teacher, I could really understand perhaps litigation following. But in this article, when you look at the cases, there seem to be a lot of litigation happy parents in this article. I don't know how the two of you feel about it. I, I, well, the, You're a lawyer. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> Certainly, you know, if, if someone's being beaten at school and no one's doing anything about it, sure, Sue. But I, yeah. you know, what I really yeah. like about this uh, article is that all of the cases we're talking about private schools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the wonderful thing about private schools is if you don't like them, you can actually take your money and go to the next school. Unlike <laughs> the public school, you're forced to pay yes. for. And if these things were going on in a public school, they would still take your money, and I think that's disgraceful. Uh, you wouldn't be able to sue them to get your money back, that's for certain, because it's, it's mm -hmm. put in a common pool by taxes. Uh, so, in some ways, the fact that the person can sue, the fact that the person can take their money out and go to the next school is a quality control thing. Uh, I just wish th that I wasn't forced to uh, pay to a school uh, that I don't necessarily want my child to go to. I like the school my children go to in, in yes. my case, but what if I didn't? And so, uh, I would like that choice, and it's taken mm -hmm. away from you when you're taxed. But uh, the other ironic thing in, in this is that it was a Montessori school. Mm -hmm. And Montessori schools are schools designed to, in, in particularly, to build self-esteem by helping children to learn not just the what's, but the why's. So I found it ironic that that mm -hmm. was the school being sued for not mm -hmm. uh, helping with the self-esteem or damaging the self-esteem. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Dr. Williamson? Well, I think it's all hot air except for the bullying incidents. Yes. If they are real and genuine, then yes. that's the school's yes. responsibility and in part the teachers. But the rest of it, no. And I'm glad you're saying if it's real and genuine because yeah. I don't know how many people watching can honestly say they were never bullied in school. From what I gather, a lot of people were. But at the same time, being harassed, having a, having a little um, problem with a fellow student or maybe a couple bugging you once in a way, I mean, you can say, well, it's a case of bullying. But when it becomes a case where it's a malicious bullying ongoing, the kid has been complaining to the school, the behavior is changing, the parents complaining to the school, the school does nothing about it. I, I, I'm not completely against this action being taken, yep. but this article the way it's it's saying that more parents are turning to the courts when their children fail in school. Do you think it was a case of, okay, do I dare say it again, more media hype? Uh, you know, it could be. The other thing is that often a person will sue for things like mental distress because yes, they're they trying do. to, yeah, but because they're trying to fluff up a claim that's really just about a breach of contract. In other words, if you paid for a school that teaches uh, a child in a way that builds a self-esteem and they don't deliver, well, then you get your money back, and that might not be enough to cover the, even the legal bills in the case of a, an education. I mean, an education, what, you're talking a five or $10,000 claim, maybe mm -hmm. twenty at the, at the very best schools. And so um, if you want to fluff that up and make sure that your legals are covered, you might want to say, oh, and by the way, my child suffered this horrible mental distress, uh, and so throw on another seven or ten or 15000 Your Honor. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that <laughs> happened in this case, but it wouldn't surprise me if that's the part of the claim that the media locked onto mm -hmm. and, and turned it into a whole thing about mental distress. It's, it, actions that are exclusively about mental distress, the infliction of mental this distress, is very rare. Mm -hmm. Summed up in the word over parenting. Over parenting, well, yes. 
in this article here, you see evidence of what you just said there, um, articulated here that a professor, Andereg his name is, now he teaches, he's a psychology professor, and he says that parents misplaced anxiety they are overprotecting their children and they're failing to even train their children that in this life you're going to have adversity. Did you, be, did you believe that? Yeah, well, you know, you can overparent, you can overparent yeah. by telling kids what to do. That maybe the focus should be on telling them how to do it for themselves. And we're yes, going to have to. Absolutely. And we're going to have to close on that note. Thank you both so much for joining me today. And that's all the time we have for today. See you again next time when we discuss women's health. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, thank you for watching.